<laughs> Never true. I'm wrong. Welcome every morning. Did I say you're welcome every morning? I've been traveling. I'll be on like a flock dog, folks. So please forgive me. My name's Brian Hay. I'm a complete idiot from cultural cybersecurity. And it is my esteemed pleasure this morning to introduce you to a wonderful group of people who will hopefully provide an enormous enlightenment of the challenge that so many of our organizations are facing today. And that is what to do when the hell, when it all unleashes upon you with a cyber crisis events such as ransomware. So we're going to take you on a journey this morning. We're not going to have all the answers. And that's not the point of this exercise. It's it's get insights from experts. One of the things I constantly see when I'm talking to clients is they're trying to manage things within themselves totally without areas of expertise. And the thing is, as we evolve to this challenge as a community, as an organization, as individuals, we got to come to the realization we need specialist skill sets and special partners to get us through this challenge. So what I would like to do is first of all, introduce uh, you to the panel. Now these people can talk as you're soon going to find out and they have great things to say. So I'll introduce them and uh, cause I know that if I allowed Simon to do a personal introduction, we'd get underway in about another 12 and a half minutes. <laughs> so if I could introduce Lisa Goddard, uh, Dhoni Media, expert in cyber crises um, communications, Ben Warren from Alan Warren Napa Lawyers, who is providing, gonna provide some pretty cool insights from a legal perspective that I'm sure you've never thought about. Simon Peaty, uh, extraordinary experience in his background in, in the military, and now he's taken his risk knowledge from those environments into his business with Escalate Consulting. And Dr. James Carlopio, um, so organizational psychologist extraordinaire, of course, with the famous or infamous business and company cultural cybersecurity. So folks, thank you so much for this morning. Um, if I could just put out um, feel free with your dialogue. We know there's no script. This is a confirm this is confirmation that I'm giving to you that we are embarking upon an exploration. I will try to provide that structure and I'm going to unleash some circumstances. Now I've given you an idea, but I will put you in the position of warning that I may change the, the ideas as we proceed if you're answering the questions and providing too much relevance. And what I will encourage you, and I know you will, is to challenge each other if you don't particularly agree, because we need to come together and demonstrate how strong-minded with, with great experience, individuals can bring different perspectives that can produce extraordinary outcomes. Okay. Now, folks, please engage with these extraordinary speakers and do so through the Q&A, not through the chat. Okay. Um, we are recording this session for anyone who's not here or would like to have a, a version of it uh, to, to recant and review. Uh, it will be made available. And to all you, uh, all the audience out there, and the response has been extraordinary across the nation. So thank you very much for giving your time. Time is precious. As Warren Buffett once said, I can buy anything in the world I want except time. So your time to spend this with us is a great privilege. Now that's enough about me. I'm going to share a couple of slides now. Thank you again for everyone. And I will set the scene on what has just unfolded. If someone could confirm for me that you can see that screen. Yes, I can, phase uh, one. Beautiful, thank you, Ben. So what's just happened, folks? It appears that um, this screen or capture is popping up on all numerous computers and devices across the organization. You know, it's 9.05 and all of a sudden, the monitors are displaying to people, your files are encrypted, you can't, they can't access them. Send some Bitcoin, 250 Bitcoin, so they're asking for a fair bit of money. They provided some login credentials and a password for some reason. Okay. Now, can I just say, for the purpose of the exercise, this is a desktop, notionally, the IT team are on it. The secure cybersecurity team are on it. They're starting to look, is this real or is it not? The incident response plan has been enacted because they're starting to look and say, oh my God, what do we do? What does the incident response plan tell us to do? Because oh, let me put it out there. Most people haven't practiced it. So they think that document's going to be the, the start of their response, except for one small problem. 
um, that document is a digital document that's never been produced in hard copy and you don't have it because it's uh, it's been encrypted through as a consequence of the tax. So point one. So what do we do? And immediately following this, I'm just setting the scene, folks. We've got another message and the entity that's encrypted our, our, um, our network is Heron Ransomware. They can't spell very well, um, but it's ransomware. And so what they've doing now is providing you access to enter your login and your password details are provided in the original communication to prove that their decryptor works. Okay. Then they've sent us another one saying, you know what, we'll give you a sample of files. The clock is ticking. You've got 24 hours. What do we do? So Simon, if I can go to you first from a risk perspective, how would you assess this risk at this point in time? It looks like the majority of your data from initial scoping by the IT team have come back to you and Sue, we're in the, we're not in a good place. This is real. So Brian, uh, thanks for that. And, and great to have the opportunity to speak with you and everybody else this morning. The first thing that I'm thinking is, um, yes, I'll obviously be shocked and, and any organization when this um, occurs would, would immediately be thinking that first question of, hang on, is this real? And, and as you describe those IT organisation, your IT team or your external support team in that space will be trying to determine the legitimacy. But from a, a risk perspective, surely by now, every organisation in this country and globally is saying it's finally us because the concept of this being, um, if we talk from a risk perspective about it, is it possible or is it likely for organisations at this time? Um, absolutely, this is something that every organisation should be concerned about and should be thinking about what would we do. So the first thing that I'm thinking is, okay, it is now on us and what have we done? What do we know? Um, the, the second piece, which you've already um, put uh in, in train for us is the concept of there are plans, but they're hidden. So my other point in terms of thinking ahead is what did our plan say? How experienced, how, how, uh, what's our muscle memory uh, telling us? Now, for, for everybody that's listening right now, that should be either people nodding along and going, that's right, we've, we've started to practice this, we've started to move through, or there will be organisations that say, actually, we don't really know what that next step is. So there should be no surprise. And if somebody is looking at this and saying, I am surprised and I don't know what the next step is, from a risk perspective, I am now starting to increase the concern levels. In terms of how far would I look ahead, we now need to think about what does this mean? So understanding exactly what that application that is encrypted is, what was contained in it, and what are the consequences of that that can be contained both in risk assessments, but also your business continuity plans. That is the piece from my side to, to determine what is the potential consequence of this action. And do we have a plan B or do we have a, um, a contingency plan from here? If the answer is no to any of that, then we are starting to spin and churn at a higher rate than what we're potentially prepared for for any business. Yeah, and I think to be fair, in uh, we have IT, I see this all the time, IT and security teams around the country that actually know their structure mm -hmm. and they know where their data is. Uh, they know where, you know, the general processes for disaster recovery, who they can call upon, go and get their backups. And the, the notional response or the obvious response is, okay, let's go to get into disaster recovery mode. We've confirmed it's real and we'll start to... Um, see what we can get from our backups and reinvigorate and get back online. And Brian, probably probably kind of a, a question back to you um, is who's leading at this stage? Because ah. from a cyber perspective, this is we're still at activation because there is a lot of businesses, there's a lot of executives and boards that are expecting the CISO or the IT team to become this magic organisation. So from your perspective, who's leading? Yeah, my perspective at this point of the time, it's led by the IT and cybersecurity, primarily the cybersecurity team and those with responsibility for disaster recovery, who, and that can be vary upon different climates. For the purpose of this exercise, that's where it sits. So the, oh, the CIO has been briefed, they briefed the CEO, the, the chain of command is, uh, is it, the, 
you know, the dialogue has been forwarded and they're still trying to get an assess assessment on what is the extent of the impact upon our networks, how long can they expect to be down for, and what's our um, point of recovery and what we should be considering. The other question the executive asked, two things I had was, what, what's this Bitcoin stuff and how much does that cost in real dollars? <laughs> because there will be knowledge gaps. We take it, we live it, we breathe it, we take it for granted that everyone knows, but the truth is they don't. So it's about um, understanding that sort of position. Um, and and if, I think, sorry, just so, and I think this is where, from my perspective, um, when we start to, pardon the pun, escalate this as we go, this is probably our only opportunity to get in front of it. And this is probably a really nice segue to Lisa in terms of, um, even though it may be being led operationally by that um, by that team, that ability to understand where it could go and starting to make people aware of of the potentials uh, the potential consequences means that this may be your only opportunity to get things in place before it goes loud. Lisa, I, I think from a comms perspective, the more time, the the better. Yeah, preparation is king when it comes to situations like this. And look, we get phone calls all the time where you have corporates or organisations who don't have a comms plan in place. They don't have an updated media policy. So when these things have, or social media policy for that fact. So when these things happen, the best advantage you can give yourself is to bring the, the crisis comms team in early. You may have an internal team, but they don't have the scalability to deal with potentially something that is well beyond their scope. And, you know, by bringing in outside experts, you're then able to have someone there who deals with crisis situations and has that media relations relationship um, active and, and dealing with it every day or every second day, they can come in and back you up. But at that point, we come in and we start to say, well, where is your comms plan? Who, what is the hierarchy as to who do you have for a spokesperson? Uh, let's start asking questions about holding statements. What are your key messages around this? All of that documentation should be sitting there so that we can quickly activate and then work out what the line of um, responsibility is as to who will be briefing the comms team and the operational response team because comms need to be a key part of that structure. And Simon, you would know that from what you've done, how if you don't have that comms team involved early, you really are behind the eight ball. Yeah. But at this stage, we're hoping for a quick recovery. So one of the things I would challenge out there, you, they, the criminals provided us with an opportunity to, A, test their decryption with a sample of the data they allegedly taken. Now, so that straight away, that implies they have exfiltrated data. Now, what we've seen with recent events here in Australia is they have exfiltrated very large volumes of data, but it's still handy to know from a forensics investigation perspective where that data came from. What part of the organisation was it? When was it last sourced? Is it data that's 10 years old, 10 minutes old, um, 10 days old? And all of these things go in. So it's interesting when you have conversations, there should be a debate, you would expect, around, hang on, there are, the criminal's asking us to click on a link to get access to the data. So the obvious thing, right, stand up a separate system that doesn't connect to your network and test that environment so you can make that determination. And met often it's, a, no, we don't click on the link. But if you take the appropriate steps, that intelligence that you can gain for that is important and should be considered. Brian, um, can I just can I just ask a uh, ask a point there because you're talking even with that question that you're asking, many organisations will not have the knowledge base or capability to answer that, and even even um, small to medium enterprises, and I would even argue that some larger businesses across Australia and, and globally, who have got teams that are there purely from an IT systems maintenance perspective. Um, so that concept of expertise, and, and I think this ties into, again, how far am I looking ahead, is understanding from an organisation what is your capability and what are you going to be able to do internally and what do you need um, external support and advice on. Um, again, Lisa's talked about getting in front of a marketing, uh, sorry, of a, of a communications message. Again, we have seen consistently through real events and crisis events that their communications team is purely a marketing team. It's not a crisis comms team. And again, I would argue from a cyber perspective, 
that the, the cyber team is very good at managing their systems, but very poor at understanding what, what does what is our requirement and what is our capability. Because you even talk about forensic um, analysis. Does your team even have that, that capability? And so who else are you going to ask? Do you know that now? Or is that something that you're going to have to discover through, through the crisis event? Simon, will you stop being proactive and moving forward, please? Sorry. Allow me to guide this conversation where it appropriately needs to go. So such pertinent, valuable information may be considered. <laughs> okay. So at this stage, we're still trying to find out. So for the purpose of the exercise, guess what? We're going to find out that um, the backup data is also encrypted. So the, the, the IT team and the security team has gone away. They've done a bit of a restoration. Sometimes this, in some organizations, this can be quite quick because of the systems in place and other times it can be much longer. Sadly, there are organizations out there, sadly have never done a full-blown data backup and restoration recovery exercise. So they don't know how long it'll take. And another message has now been received that if payment is not made quickly, that data will be leaked publicly into the dark web by tomorrow afternoon. Okay, they're, they're restricting the timelines, they're putting more pressure on the business, the situation is looking more dire. And just to throw it in there, media are now making inquiries that someone has posted the incident on social media. So it's got worse. The, uh, the risk is now increased, I'd suggest, and the media are involved. Now, Lisa, when the media knock gets, you know, they're knocking on the door for answers because we have now lost control. If, before we go down that path, I'd like you, if you could share in terms of a crisis, how quickly should organizations, let's go back to the just one step, phase one, there's internal awareness because that message is popping up. How critical was it that the internal comms team try and contain that situation with internal messaging? Look, it's essential. What they need to do is you need to look at this from two different perspectives. One, you've got your internal communications and then you've got your external communications. So external, we're talking about those media that are calling, turning up at your front door, demanding answers. Internal is also critical. You must bring everybody into the tent with you. So you've got your internal staff who no doubt possibly could have seen this or have heard you know, that there is something happening. So you have to ask yourself some really serious questions about how many people are aware of what's happening? What is the risk to our business continuity at this point? What's the chance of this being found out you know, outside of our walls? And then how are we going to manage that? And then you need to start looking at structurally, what have you got in place? Like, do you have all the stakeholders that you need to contact on from an internal perspective? Do you have lists that are current up-to-date contact details for uh, all of your staff, all of your stakeholders, all of your consultants, all of your contractors. What about the government? What about the regulators? Then you look at the media. What contacts have you got there that you need to you know, update or, or inform them of what's happening? So many times we will go in and people don't have, as ridiculous as this may sound, a spreadsheet or a, some sort of data list there of who they need to contact should this happen. And then therefore you have teams of people scurrying around trying to find current emails or current phone numbers. It can be an absolute nightmare. So one, they need to have that in place. Two, the internal comms team need to think about how are we going to communicate this? And so you know, we work with them then to say, is the scale of this looking like we need to activate a hotline? If there's a hotline set up, do we or at a call centre? Where's the script for that? All of this takes a lot of time because it's not just a simple, you know, hello, you've reached so-and-so, how can we help you? You need to work out how to divert those calls through. Is it media? Is it a shareholder? Is it a customer? So you manage that and have it all come into one central point as well. You need to look at, do you need a landing page on your website so that you can inform people of what's happening? Who's That's going if your to website's working. Well, exactly. Or how else are you, or do you set up another landing page somewhere to inform people? You have to be seen to be out there and trying to stay ahead of it and communicating with people. Because if you don't, then you really do lose control of that narrative. And then you've got other people filling that space. So you're suggesting right at point one, even though the situation was relatively unknown, with certain events were happening, but you would have preferred to be a part of the awareness of that incident right almost from the immediacy. Because at that point, we are doing that audit. What do you have in place and what do we need to start building out? Because if it does go out into the media and it does become a bigger 
uh, crisis situation, then you don't have time on your side. Time is really critical. And I'm talking minutes. And when the, the media storm hits, anyone who's listening who has had to deal with the media in a even a small time crisis knows how quickly those calls and those inquiries come through. And if you don't have systems in place, who's logging calls from the media if they start to come through? Who are they being sent through to? What's your frontline staff going to say if they pick up the phone and there's a reporter on the line? What's happening internally? What are your internal staff doing with emails or um, information that they're getting? All of that needs to be put in place so that you are right to, to, as soon as you need to push the button to go live, you're right to go. So just on the issue, this was leaked out in this search for the purpose of the exercise on social media by presumably an internal member of staff who saw one of these things. What are any ideas, tips or strategies to um, that organisations could evoke or invoke um, to try and limit how do you manage that internal social media leakage challenge? The preference is always to try to keep it in-house if you can contain it and look I do know of a very very large private company that had a, a cyber attack and it shut down their internal systems nothing was put in writing but all staff were, were told this is to stay internal they were very lucky everybody kept their mouths closed and it wasn't put out into the public at all importantly and this will talk to what Simon's involved with they managed to keep the business operating so to the outside world nothing had occurred Internally, they managed to contain it, but I would say that that's a rarity. You know, it's yeah. human nature. Someone talks to somebody and it gets out. And then if you're an ASX listed company or, or you have to meet your requirements for reporting, which Ben and Simon can talk about, then you know, you know once you have to report it, you've lost control there. Like it's, it's out there. You can't stop it. So you, yep. you have to have all of those plans in place. Okay. I would just want to defer to James here if I can. And then, Ben, I want to come to you with a question. James, looking at what Simon and Lisa have said, mm -hmm. how quickly then, if you can't communicate your, to all of your people because your systems are down or inhibited and things are happening so fast, how critical is it to have your people both aware and behaviourally sound through an organisational culture that they know what to do. And that is what, if we're faced with this event, we definitely do not tell the world first. Absolutely. No, the, the, the first time you think about all these things, and that's why everybody's here on this call today, right? Because the first time you think about these things cannot be during the actual crisis, right? That's, that's in, insanity 101, right? You have to have thought through this. You have to have done the practice and the desktop exercise. But right back to basics. And, and we did it in this call, right? As soon as you flashed up phase one, everybody's brain went to, this is a network and technical issue. What you need to do as soon as you see this is get, this is a staff issue, a customer issue, and a business issue. The IT people know what they're doing. What we need to manage, the crisis is in people, in staff, in customers, in business. So yeah, absolutely, Brian, they, they have to have, thought through this and the, the culture is, you know, what, what makes it automatic because they've yep. practiced it before and it's part of what they do. It's how they breathe. Yep. So it can't be just a process. It's got to be embedded in instinctive behavior, doing the right thing because that's in your DNA and your organization's Absolutely. culture. Okay. Thank you. Uh, ben, I know you've been sitting there very silent, which is unusual for uh, people of your ilk and your background because <laughs> you get paid to write words and speak words. So may I ask you, at phase two, would you have liked to have known a bit, had an inkling to this at phase one, or no, I'm happy to wait to phase two. And if you, after you answer that, if you get, please explain what is going through your mind from a legal perspective at this time. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, look, I think there's a couple of words that came up in earlier in this conversation that should be trigger points for people to contact the lawyer. Um, one of them was exfiltrate, meaning the data has not only been encrypted within the uh, company system, but rather it's been taken out of the company system and is in the possession of the criminal. Um, and I use you know, the word criminal deliberately, um, and we'll come to why later. So the second one, 
that I've heard used is investigation. And so in the context of data has left the um, organisation, it's in the hands of criminals and we're investigating it. I want people to think about lawyers at that point because um, one of the things that uh, people often don't think about in this context are words like class action. There's a massive class action brewing um, by uh, large national class action firms like Morris Blackburn um, against the likes of Medibank Private. Um, you only need to Google you know, class action Medibank Private and you'll quickly find their website um, for breach of personal information. Uh, but I also want people to think about um, the potential for massive uh, statutory fines for a breach of the privacy legislation. Privacy legislation in many years gone past used to be sort of a toothless tiger, but since um, the European Union brought in GDPR and then Australia followed suit um, relatively recently by bumping up fines, they can now include um, a percentage of total company revenue or turnover. Um, and so think of fines, think of class action, think of legal professional privilege, which I'll just very briefly explain. Legal professional privilege is like the trump card for keeping things confidential in a legal process. So um, often in any kind of legal process, there is the right to subpoena documents or obtain access to records through a disclosure or discovery process. And legal professional privilege is, um, uh, protects the secrecy of confidentiality, uh, confidentiality of these records um, in circumstances where the purpose that the record was created was for the was to seek and obtain legal advice. Um, and so I think it's you know Brian very cleverly left it twenty five minutes into the webinar before um, introducing the lawyer. Um, There's a good reason for that. We're paying by the minute. You just cost us a fortune. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I um, very cleverly left at 25 minutes and I would argue that that, that, that was way too late in a real life situation. <laughs> um, because one of the things you want to do is get in contact with a lawyer and say, hey, look, we need some legal advice because we think that there's been a data breach um, incident that could um, lead to potential legal action and we want you to give us advice on it. And then the lawyer says, all right, well, if I'm going to give you advice on this issue, I need you to go away and investigate how it is that this incident arose um, and what your options are from a technical perspective on how to deal with it. And then I can give you legal advice on, um, you know, where your exposure might be and um, what sort of defences we might have to claims. And then there's at least an argument then that the results of any investigation become the subject of legal professional privilege because they're being the investigation is being conducted at the recommendation of the lawyer for the purpose of then giving the results of that investigation to the lawyer so the lawyer can give legal advice uh, and that means that um, if you hadn't done that and the investigation found wow we really dropped the ball that becomes records that other people can access down the track if um, it is subject to legal professional privilege and the investigation finds, wow, we really dropped the ball, um, that's something that you can keep behind um, secrecy wall. Okay. So oh, just on that point, case. hang on a second, I want to come to you, Lisa, because what I'm hearing from, you know, the sneaky lawyer in the back corner of the room that says, let's shut down all containment flow of information, which is in complete opposition to some of the, from a communication strategy that you must engage and give something because does that mean then your comms, crisis comms needs to negotiate with the legal team to get the right message that's good for both parties? Absolutely. Well, firstly, put a different cap on it. As my, as my journalist, which I was for decades, I absolutely loathe the idea of what the advice that um, Ben just gave, but it's spot on. From a crisis comms perspective, it's spot on because it's about protecting the company. The journalist in me, my heart breaks that we don't get that information. <laughs> Very clever. Um, look, now, from a crisis comms perspective, when you're looking, you have, to, you have to go out there. A lot of people will say no comment or worse, we've had incidents where the clients will just ignore media calls. We had one where there were 36 media calls within a couple of hours and they just chose to ignore them. 
And so by the time they came to us, we had to clean that mess up and then try and get them in front of it, which we did. But you can always say something. No comment isn't the answer. If you say no comment or um, the journalist can, has the opportunity to say X company uh, didn't respond to our phone calls or wasn't available for comment, you look like you're hiding. You look like you're guilty of something and you don't want to do that. There is always something that you can put into that initial holding statement and forward through the rest of your messaging, which says that you, there is an investigation underway, that safe ground, that an incident has occurred, what you're doing. So the, when you're talking about crisis comms and that holding statement, acknowledge action and update. There you, there are the three key points. You must provide information on those and you can do it in a way that you're not uh, giving information that you don't want out in the public arena, but you are giving yourself a voice in that narrative. Otherwise, you are silent, and I'm sorry, you, you look like you're hiding it or you're guilty. Yep, yeah, and I just want to jump in there, Lisa, because I think we're on exactly the same page. As much as I um, love... I don't know when we just didn't like it. The crisis <laughs> yeah. loved it. And everything that we do has to go through legal. As part of that internal structure, when you're dealing with... The, the CMT and, you, and you're running through this crisis, everything that the comms puts out needs to be legal. It, not only does it need to have an approvals process, and sorry, Ben, just quickly, what you need to do internally is position somebody who is the, the lead contact for your crisis comms and internal comms experts because we need fast approval. When, when things are moving so quickly and you've got media inquiries coming through and you've got you know, various questions being thrown at you on social media, you need to be able to get what you're writing those documents approved quickly so you can distribute them because often you get caught in the it has to go to this person and it goes further up the chain you don't have time for that in a crisis yeah and 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 look and on that legal professional privilege point the um the objective is to break the heart of the journalist um or break the heart <laughs> i know the... i've been there i know <laughs> or to break the heart of the class action lawyer um or to break the heart of the um the claimants who want to say that oh we've suffered loss because of your negligence and um and you know we want compensation for that or um, break the heart of the client when they get the bill is that what you're saying uh, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> just a given with any <laughs> any legal no, name, I, I know yeah, i know I simon <laughs> or, very quickly say 25 words or less yeah um just very quickly say that um it's about controlling the flow of that information. The, the lawyer's job is not to close up every little bit of information. We do want to work with the comms team because God knows that I'm, you know, I'm not too bad at giving people bad news, but I'm not, I'm hopeless at giving spin. I'm I'm only basically there to go, yeah, it's shit. Like, and then now you've got to deal with it. Um, all and right. so it's about like containing, all right, well, this is what we are going to keep within the closed doors. And then this is how we control that message. Okay. Thank you, Simon. If I could go to you and ask you to, if I could, so how was the risk position changed at this point in time? Or what are you starting to think from a risk management perspective? Well, I, I, I think tying into those conversations that have just occurred, Brian, um, I'm not going to, the, the catch-all is it depends, but the reason why this is so critical is you've just heard from, from experts in terms of what their expectations are. And going to James's point of the worst time to learn how to do a crisis is in a crisis. That concept of if you have engaged your communications response team, if that's an external, prior to, so you know exactly what Lisa is looking for. You've already received training on um, for all of your management and executives on what their expectations are and what Lisa would be expecting from, from that team as you're going through that. If you've already engaged with your legal uh, counsel, be it, be it internal or external, to understand through a, one of these types of events um, what their expectations and what how quickly, because I've seen the difference been, um, in legal privilege in real events between days when someone thinks of it as an afterthought or in the first crisis management meeting, it's one of the first things that's raised and, we, and, and we're moving from there. So, Brian, to specifically answer your question, prior preparation and that, that um, opportunity to have had these things in place as real controls um, and treatment actions to the material risk will judge the risk position that you're in. In terms of how it has changed from here from what we've seen, there is absolutely an increase now in the associated 
risks that we now need to deal with um, as we're moving forward. So we're starting to get more information and that will then start to feed out into what other things we need to consider from here. Already at this point, I'm starting to, again, ask that question about what is your plan B at phase two? You know, what are the other things that you need to put in place? And, um, and I, can yeah. I just ask you, um, when do we start thinking about notifying the board? Uh, so again, the catch-all would be, what does your plan say? However, the, the right, the-, the well, right, But remember, we don't have the plan because and, and again, it's encrypted. And, so there's there's two pieces. I, I sorry, I, um, I take the point. The and I always go back to how do you build that muscle memory? But the the answer to this is the last thing that boards want is a surprise. That is that is if you ask any board um, globally or in and in this country, what do they not want is to be surprised. Um, we're not talking and asking the board to activate, come in, hold a war room of their own, but a notification at the appropriate point that you know that this is a legitimate threat or the possibility of it of, of it becoming a strategic event the notification is clear do not withhold that information because you will regret it later so can i ask you and then i'll, I'll defer to the others and i think lisa has already mentioned it and ben has um i said right at the beginning a lot of organizations tend to immediately close shop how critical is it to help address a crisis event to ensure you've got the right skills around the table and embrace the um, your external stakeholders for those specialist insights and experiences that can help you shape your response? Uh, it's, it is absolutely critical. And it comes down to capability, um, Brian, with, within an organisation. There will be some organisations that, that have... Um, outstanding capability in the certain response areas that we would expect, um, any of us on this call would expect, um, but under having a realistic understanding of your capability and what is available to you through different um, areas, because we talked about notification, the one that we haven't discussed is whether or not you've notified at this point your insurer, because do you have coverage or a policy for this? Because that can open up for you an entire um, stream of additional supporting assets with some risk that comes to it in terms of ownership of, um, and prioritisation. But um, if you, it comes down to capability, what you're comfortable with, and you, the worst time to learn that is in the crisis. You need to have known that coming through. What about intelligence? How critical is it to get the right information and intelligence on the situation you're faced with and your adversary for that matter. Yeah, uh, it is absolutely, again, it is absolutely critical because that will inform your decisions. If you are making decisions blind and, and again, as we potentially learn more about this, we've, we've got the adversary's name, we've got the attacker's name. Believe it or not, the first thing that came up is, is this is this a, um, Ben called them criminals, but is it a Good criminal, like a legitimate criminal, a well-known criminal that we're going to be able to, to learn more about in terms of their tactics, techniques and procedures. And again, getting that from an expert who can verify and, and have that understanding. Or is it is it literally a kid in their basement in a hoodie, which we don't see often anymore, but that concept of, of is this going to give us options in our response moving forward? Intelligence is going to inform us as whether or not as to whether or not those options are available to us, Brian. Beautiful. Now we're we're now going into a high stress environment. You know, things are getting worse and we're going into the lockdowns. So the place is a buzz. James, in, in times of crises with these high stress levels, what would you suggest from a your perspective should be management and leaders start to think about coping strategies for people to deal with this. Absolutely. Great, great question. What the brain does in stress is basically the executive function goes offline and the amygdala, you know, hijacks us. We've all heard of the amygdala hijack and, you know, emotional intelligence and all this sort of stuff. This is exactly where that becomes relevant because your brain under stress narrows, shuts off, and it is totally normal. And look, and people might not know why we, you know, the criminal keeps wanting to do things quickly. As you said, the, the data is really, really clear. If they get paid within the first hour, the first half a day, 
their chances of getting paid after that go way down. So they want it to happen really, really quickly. And they're going to put stress on us and pressure on us. And we have to be able to breathe. I know this sounds stupid, <laughs> you know, as a, as a personal thing, it's the most direct way we can reduce our stress to just keep breathing, but go back to the plans and practice and practice. There's no, there's no professional on the planet who got to world class without rehearsal and practice. And what we're talking about here is the exact same thing. You folks out there who are listening to this, you have got to practice and practice and rehearse and practice so that when you're at the tee or you're about to kick the ball or hit the tennis ball or whatever it is, it's just in your muscle memory. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm going to mix things up a little bit. I'm just conscious of time. I want to go to uh, phase three. We've got information that's now received from a dark market intelligence provider that the company's data has now been offered for sale in the dark web. What that data is, is unknown. Okay, at this stage. Now it begs two questions. We know data has been exfiltrated. The, the, the obvious link people will come to is that data is what was exfiltrated. Well, it may actually be from a different hacker. If you've had a vulnerability that's been exploited, it may be from the ransomware or it may be com something completely separate. So something to think about. And just to hamper your recovery efforts, um, the you, the, you're now being hit by a DDoS attack. And mm -hmm. again, to James' point, putting more pressure on the decision makers, complicating and making messier uh, the, 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 the issue of considerations and the volume of issues to contend with. And now, uh, Lisa, clients, uh, now they, it's out there well and truly, it's in the media, and they want to know what the heck is going on. Social media is going gangbusters, and that momentum of public expectation is, is building. What are the, I know you've talked a lot already, Lisa, about getting things in place. What are the systems you need to set up for this ongoing, enduring challenge that is going to be the communications? Yeah, this is the tsunami. This is what everybody dreads. So the reason you have to do all of the prep work, as you say, Brian, is when this happens, you are right to go. So you can manage it. You've got the channels in place. So one, you have to log all of the media calls that are coming through. You have to have a point of contact within that comms team that all of that information is flowing to. You need to arm your frontline staff who are, who are receiving these inquiries with the right questions to ask of the media so that you can help the comms team better manage those inquiries. So who is the journalist? Where are they from? What's their deadline? What are they asking? When you're talking about customers who are online, what well, they want to hear from you, they want empathy. Number one, you have to provide some sort of statement which says that you understand um, that you are what, what action you are taking. I said before, it's the acknowledge action and then update to stay ahead of the media and to try to contain the, the I mean, imagine it's a growing rage at this point and confusion from people who have been potentially impacted by this is how often are we going to get updates from you? Are you across this? There might be, um, you know, frantic activity happening in the war room, but the front facing of this business has to show that we are calm and that we are working through this and we have your interests at heart. So can you I just ask you, yeah, can I just on that point, your age are obviously some extraordinarily valid issues. And you you something you said just triggered me back to my 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 days in the in law enforcement when you had a major event happening. One of the things we used to do was tell the media list give us some breathing room and set up regular sit reps to the media room. So you, you, the media scrum would form and they knew you were coming to give them this latest update. And that gave us a greater sense of control to a lot of that noise. Is that something you recommend? Exactly. If you hark back and I don't know how many people on here are old enough to remember, but so Joe Bjorki Peterson used to say, it's feeding the chooks, right? So when you've got this crisis and it's moving very quickly in the background for us, we need the media to be, uh, okay, we will update you again in an hour or two hours. We know where they are. Hopefully that then stems the flow of media calls that are coming in, which is adding to that high stress environment that we're operating in. So the more control you can put around that, and James is right, you have to try and bring that pace back. So that's why we have systems in place. So that, that, like I said, if you have a call center set up, 
those calls are coming in, the information is flowing into the comms team from one channel. The channel's coming in from all the front front staff, front desk staff who are, who are receiving phone calls. Um, our numbers are now out there so that media know to call us and to take the pressure off the company. So you have to have all those structures in place so that we can control it. And, and control is a good word. So Simon, how important is setting up, and I'm going to use you know, paramilitary terms, you're ex-military, but I'm going to use how important it is to set up a command and control structure to manage this, to a manager crisis? Yeah. So control measures prevent, uh, provide clarity in the chaos. Um, that's that's the line. Um, when you when you have control measures in place, and, and in this case, um, a clear understanding of roles and responsibilities, um, uh, it means, uh, as James was talking about in terms of of um, operating under stress, um, major muscle movements rather than fine motor skills. It's that clarity of being able to know uh, where do I go, and it just is something that something else that nobody uh, that you don't have to critically think of under that stress and pressure. Um, but the other thing about about the command aspect, just really briefly, is making sure that the people that you put into those positions have the capability to do it because not everybody can. Um, yep. So again, preparing them, having them ready, having the right person in the room, because just because somebody is in a leadership position, business as usual, does not mean under stress and pressure, they're going to be the right person. And you can only learn that in exercise. Excellent. And talking of stress and pressure, I've just invited the lawyer into the room <laughs> to answer this pertinent question that is going through the minds of the board. And that is, should we just pay these bastards and get our data and our situation sorted? Ben, yeah. that's to you, by the way. Just Yeah, yeah, good question. question. So um, <laughs> uh, lawyers can often justifiably be accused of um, hedging in their answers to direct questions. <laughs> and the reason is because it's complicated. Really what you're trying to do is balance two competing interests. Um, or at least two competing interests. On the one hand, you have to act in the best interests of the company as a director. Um, I mean, that's just given any director that doesn't know that it shouldn't be in the role. Um, the second thing you have to be aware of, though, is that there is a risk associated with paying the ransom. Earlier, I used the, the word criminal. Um, for the people that are doing this, because quite often, as, as Brian, you know, um, these people are not the guy in the hoodie in the basement. They are organised, systemized experts at um, organised crime and or potentially funding terrorism. And I use those uh, terms deliberately because it's important to be to be aware that there is legislation that says that if you are reckless to whether or not you're funding terrorism or organised crime, um, there's a potential criminal consequence. Now, nobody has in Australia been uh, prosecuted for this crime of paying a ransomware demand and, um, and then it being asserted against them that um, they funded terrorism and, and now face jail time for doing that. Um, but there I think is... for the purpose of the exercise, it's just for the, you know, based on history so far mm -hmm. in ransomware gangs, the way they operate, let's just say for the purpose of this exercise, Haron is actually against terrorism from some of the postings they've made in some of their forums and in the dark web. So we know with clarity, they are completely driven by profit, not sure. any ideology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is like a well a funding issue i mean once you hand it over the cash um you don't know what they're going to do with it and just because somebody professes to have a particular um objective or um uh rationale for their conduct doesn't necessarily mean that that's true i mean they're a criminal after all <laughs> but um yep. but i think I mean, the I... key thing, thing to be aware of in trying to balance these competing considerations is that and it's come up before and it's really important. I think insurance, insurance, insurance is one of the themes of this seminar or should be. Um, I think the other theme of this uh, webinar is um, planning, you know, train in advance of the incident. And that's what insurance is for. It's um, 
it's the premium you pay or the price you pay, the training is the price you pay as well for um, being in a position when the proverbial is hitting the fan that you, you can respond appropriately with the right resources. Look, I always relish the opportunity to cross-examine a lawyer. And I just want to take you back to something you just said. Hey, listen, I had many, many, many days in the witness box. That's, it's nice to have a crack back. But you said there that there are conflicting areas. So if I put forward to you this proposition, could the circumstances be that in a crisis, cyber crisis ransomware event, if, say, the demand was a million dollars, the cost of recovery to the business, it is so devastating that to rebuild and everything else, it could actually be, it was estimated at $40 million, which would bankrupt the company. Could the directors be accused of failing in their duties to act in the best interest of the company by taking a moral stand not to pay, therefore face charges under the Corporations Act? Yeah, that's a risk. So you're saying payment may actually be the best action uh, in the interests of the directors in a prov in dis and behaving in the interests of the company? Uh, as, as long as they're not on the sanction list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. I think it is. Like, But having said that, I think far better than having to make that decision to pay themselves is the decision they should have made uh, now or well in advance of the incident occurring to get insurance for this sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think you raise a brilliant, it raises a great point. A lot of people tend to think things in black and white. You can, you or can't you? And I've never heard that perplexing challenge raised before. And I think I've never even heard it being discussed before. Um, and We've just got a, a Q&A or a comment by uh, Robert uh, from the audience who said, you'll always also have to discuss with your insurer about payment. And that's a great question. I assume Robert's talking about, is it can they or will they, or will they cover the cost of that ransomware payment? Uh, that's a great question. Anyone it's, got any comment on that? Yeah, so it's, it's not only the insurer, because, um, but, but it's also there's, and there, there isn't, Precedent for this yet, I believe, but it is definitely a discussion as to whether or not your financial institution, especially post the Banking Royal Commission here in Australia, whether or not your financial institution will release the funds for that uh, for that particular payment as well. There's a there's a really interesting line. Um, again, I go back to um, even even Brian, your point um, and your scenario that you placed to Ben about. Does an organisation has an organisation actually done the analysis to understand what the cost of recovering critical operations are, which would be a business continuity uh, a type uh, analysis um, discussion prior to the event, because it, that that is not an easy question. No, answer. not at all. Well, and, he's an even tougher yeah. question for Lisa, and Lisa, that is, would you inform the public that you may have paid them? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, look, I think the public need to know that you, if you've recovered the data or what the risk is to them now, or if you've contained that risk to them, uh, I, I think that would be a case of the comms team working in with your, the, the risk management and the lawyers and, and the execs and working out what they want to be out there publicly. Um, and, and can I just say... I think you've made, if from my opinion, the, made the, the most salient points is what you've done to protect the data of the public mm -hmm. um, and to resolve the issue. And really, to me, the only ones that sh um, sh should know about whether the ransom was paid or not is the, uh, is the organisation itself, because normally that's a you know, question from those prime members of the media. It makes a great story, but Joe Blog sitting at home just wants to know, well, okay, is my data now protected? Has the threat been removed? And what do I need to do? Well, it comes back to, to sort of communications 101. You always have to think about who the audience is. So if you are, in, say, in a, a Medibank type scenario, you're talking to the people whose personal health records have been compromised as well as the, their personal identification data. So the, the way that you write 
the holding statements and the ongoing statements media releases, the language that you choose is really, really important. And we saw, we can think back to Optus and Medi Medibank. Medibank were really, um, I think, made some very deliberate choices about the language they used. And there was a lot of, you know, we've managed to, we, we protect um, and that the number of uh, various other potential attacks that they've sort of thwarted over the time or, or protected their, their clients or customers from. So we spend a lot of time, as much as you can in that sort of fast moving environment, working out what is the exact language that we can use for the effect that we want to achieve when, by the time we hit the target audience. So okay. identify the audience and work backwards. Okay, brilliant. And I just want to jump in quickly and thumbs uh, up. 25 words or less. Simon and Lisa, double double thumbs up. Um, yeah, the uh, twenty five words or less. Brian, you're a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just used up twelve, thirteen, said fifteen left. <laughs> but because um, the Privacy Act breaches relate to whether or not you took reasonable steps to protect people's personal information, so um, you want to be able to a truthfully and accurately say that you that reasonable steps had been taken and then of course you want to communicate that yep thank you good job now folks here's the real challenge by the end of this hour i would last like to ask you all for a couple of tips that you would give in summary of of this uh, process and but before that we've got two great questions uh, we have four and a half minutes left so i'm just conscious of time so very quick fire. One question from Jamie is that, do we feel that um, some of the organizations subject to recent uh, events, refusing to pay a ransom and highly sensitive personal data being released to the public has set a precedent in Australia going forward that exposes us as individuals. So if the process is they're going to ex allow the data to sit out there, they're not going to pay anything to recover it or get it back. Does that make us more vulnerable as people moving forward? Yeah, I might jump on that. Like, I think it does set a precedent. I think it was probably the wise decision because um, as hard as that is a sell to the public to say, you know, we didn't pay because, and then the message can be interpreted as we didn't look after your interests. The fact is, is that there's no guarantee that by paying you've protected their interests anyway. Um, once it's leaked, it's leaked and um, you can't necessarily trust the uh, criminals to um, hand it all back and not resell it even after they've received the ransom money. Sure, absolutely. Any, anyone else on that? Yes, yeah, so I, I agree with Ben, like the breach breaches obviously, obviously occur, but the, the answer to this is yes. Um, I, I think uh, this is the first time that boards and executives have um, have seen a response to it. It being there, um, they were able to plead that they were still the victim. Um, it has enabled organisations to consider: Do we just go ahead and and uh, us? Because again, there was no there was no encryption. It was just a data breach, which means that the business impact was less. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got another question for you specifically in a minute, Lisa. But I'll just make one very quick comment, and that is. I think there's been a lot of hype around my identity being compromised and that's it. But I asked an audience, well, do you have a Facebook page in your own name? And of course, nearly everyone puts up their hand. Well, haven't you already surrendered your identity to the internet and therefore have you not lost control? So the, the challenge is how do we manage the risk that ensues as a consequence of that identity being stolen? But I'll, I'll leave that there. So um, question Lisa, and it's specific to the, um, uh, I won't say which company, but one of the, the big breaches, their initial approach was to only issue ASX announcement and do zero, zero media. I think you've probably answered this already. Um, what's your opinion on that in uh, 25 words? I think it's a mistake. I think as soon as you know that it's out there, you need to be in front of it yourself. And again, you need to be showing some sort of empathy and that you understand the enormity of what has happened and the impact it's having on people and reiterate again what action you're taking. Uh, not to do that, I think, is is to be... I think people feel betrayed. I think they, they don't feel like they're being um, considered to be important in, in all of this if, they, if you're not going to speak to them directly. Yep, and you know, you. you don't have to do it through the media. You can also do it through your own channels. So you can put out your own videos through social media and control the, the narrative that way as well. There's, there's a lot of doing it. 
Thank you. Um, Adrian, I see that Simon's typing your response uh, now. So please, uh, I hope he did a decent job for, you, for your sake and I hope he answered that question for you. Folk, we have exactly 90 seconds left. So if I could just uh, ask you to, if there was one or two things very quickly that you would, and asked from the, from the business, um, sorry, that you would give advice to people as a takeaway for this, what would it be? If you could, one critical thing, Lisa. Uh, we've spoken about planning, part of that planning media training, make sure you know who your spokespeople will be and make sure they've been trained so that you can roll them out there when you need to. Too many Beautiful. organizations don't have it. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I would say, uh, what are your realistic vulnerable points and what are your plan Bs for your most critical business functions? Thank you. James? We've got to rethink the way we treat customer information. We used to think it was an asset to hold, I think we now need to start to think about customer data as an actual liability. And we we can't keep it for long periods of time. It's just a disaster. Thank you very much, Ben. Yeah. Final word to the lawyer in the room. <laughs> plan, including insurance, have a plan, train on that plan. Thank you very much. Uh, panel, you've been absolutely astoundingly Fantastic. Uh, delegates, thank you so much for giving us your time today. I hope it's been uh, wonderful for you and really informed uh, uh, going forward in your considerations and deliberations around this. We're in a, we're all, in, oh, I hate to use the term, we're all in this together, but we all are all confronted with this challenge. And it's about how we prepare to meet it going forward. Because one thing I can assure you, the threat is going to increase and it will diversify and it will become more complex. However, with the right preparation, you, we can all meet this challenge. Stay safe, have a wonderful day, enjoy a brilliant weekend. You know what, if you've worked hard this week, take tomorrow off and we'll see you in the future. And we will be sharing this and providing linkage for everyone. Thanks everybody, cheers. <laughs>